very much uh, for joining us here today. We're going to talk about a couple of things in the uh, in this next 20 minutes with you around two, two general concepts. One, that the world is aging much, much faster than it ever has before. Two, that the number of people you're going to meet in your life that live to be 100 may surprise you. And then three, hopefully tie it back to what some of the firms here can do to innovate and create some amazing solutions in that space. So let's get started. I want to quickly introduce you to three people. And you may have met some of these if you travel on the East Coast. This is Betty Nash. She's in her 60th year as a flight attendant. Right? She tells stories on the East Coast of serving lobster and champagne to the Kennedys. She's probably one of the more uh, articulate people in telling you how bad airline food's gone over the last 60 years and now talks about peanuts and gin and tonics. And I can tell you as one who's traveled most of my life, she's got a fair point there. Uh, but she doesn't plan on retiring anytime soon. In the middle, Vancouver, you're looking at the woman that has the Grandmaster Javelin over 85 record. She is 103 years old. Her husband's also competing in that same uh, Grandmasters tournament, and they moved closer to a university where they trained, so they were uh, it's easier for them to get to the training facilities because they've upped their, their training regime and their calendar. And the final one, Ernestine Shepard here at 60 got into bodybuilding, 60. Right? She's now a personal trainer, and it says she's in the best age of her life, excuse me, best shape of her life, and plans to continue training for decades. Right? Definitions of age are changing. Right? Definitions of age are moving to where quality of life versus your actual attained age are getting very blurry. Uh, talk to friends who are the medical profession. There are, there's a strong argument now that you can that we can sustain a human body, depending on your definition of that, to somewhere around 120 years old. Now the question is, if you're going to live that long, what's the quality of life, what are you gonna do, what's gonna matter? The world's aging faster. Start on the left-hand side here. This is median age. It took Europe 50 years, half a century, to move that number 10 years. Okay, Asia, in the most broadest definition of Asia, and specifically by country, it's even more dramatic. It's half that time or less. Okay? So the graying, if you will, of society in Asia is moving much more rapidly than it has in Western Europe. The middle chart may surprise you. If I said I have three and a half million clients for your business that are currently have no particular focus on their interests, may surprise you that's going to be people living to be over 100, right? Uh, there's an anecdotal story out of the UK, my home's London. The Queen used to send, initially when someone turned 100 in the UK, she hand wrote a note, sent it by telegraph to that person. Okay? There are now seven people on her staff full time just to write the notes to the people in the UK that have turned 100. In Singapore in 1990, there were 50 people that were 100, there's over a 1,000 today, okay? So this brings some interesting social changes. Do you have the finances to live? Do you have the social interaction that, that, that keeps you healthy and happy and content? Are you doing things you feel that you're adding value? The headwind to it is chronic illness, disproportionately diabetes. Uh, one of my best friends in uh, Beijing, I'm gonna see in just, uh, just a few days, He's my age. He now is more likely to get diabetes than I am. Okay? That's a concept that, that was unheard of 25 years ago. So chronic illness is probably the only headwind to the health side, and financial is the core challenge globally to someone sustaining a quality of life and stress and things uh, well into their hundreds. What do they want to do? Well, they want purpose. This is a study done by our, our colleagues here in Singapore on the far left side. What are you gonna do after 62? Okay, now again, we've abolished our mandatory retirement age in our Singapore business. Okay, so we have, we have employees that work with us a very long time and, and plan on working uh, much longer. But most people wanna pursue something they're passionate about. Okay, they wanna start a business. 
They want to go back to school, get a new degree, learn a new skill. Again, these aspirations could be something if we surveyed 25 year olds. Okay, no material difference. Uh, an inaccuracy. People say, well, they're not tech savvy. They're actually quite tech savvy. Uh, internet usage, wireless usage, phone purchases. It, there's not a material difference, okay, other than physical plant, right, as consumers get older. Uh, this is one on, these are just for, for fun. These are three, this is an actor, writer. These are folks who have, uh, look at the number of followers we're talking about. Now, again, they may have a staff that does that, but managing that level of followers takes content, content that's interesting, right? That's not age-based. The third column is, how are you gonna pay for this? Okay, how are you gonna pay for this retirement? And what's, the younger people get, the less likely they believe their government has put aside enough money to fund their, their retirement. So if their retirement's gonna get longer, they're gonna need more money. In the United States, there's a survey, two surveys just done. It's been, I saw them about 20 years ago, we just found them again this year. Someone under 30 in the United States, two thirds of them believe that they will see or believe in uh, aliens, okay? Two thirds of them believe in aliens. I'm not here to debate if you believe in aliens with you. Less than half of that believe they will get a check from the United States government in their retirement. Okay? Now they weren't the same survey, to be fair. If someone's a statistician, don't challenge me afterwards. I understand survey bias. But think about the fact that millennials think they're more likely to see an alien than a check from their government in retirement. Okay? There is, they need, there's a, there's a gap there that's massive. They gotta fund their own retirement. They know that, they appreciate that. Far left, this is one of my favorite photos of all time. 1972, Stanford did this research. I'm not sure this wouldn't be considered child abuse now. I'll let you guys decide. They put a marshmallow in front of a child. You can see the age. And here's the offer. If you don't eat the marshmallow for 15 minutes, we'll give you two. Okay? I couldn't have done it at that age. It would still be close now. Okay? That's borderline like abuse of a kid now, right? Here's a chocolate bar, don't eat it for 15 minutes, I'll give you two, whatever it was. I love the face. The idea was to see if you could teach the concept of deferred gratification to a child. We actually invest pretty heavily in this as a company. We have a, a, a digital program called Cha-Ching that's in more than a dozen of our markets and I've rolled it out across Africa as well, not just Asia which has lessons for children in charity, in savings, in gifting, and how money works. Because we get college graduates into our businesses that will make financial mistakes that you would be shocked. You know, we know they're smart, we know they're capable, but there's very few points in, li in life where someone teaches you about money. And the earlier someone learns to save, all research has shown, the more likely they are to save through life. The middle one you may recognize is money box. I like this idea. It's a rounding up concept, save the pennies. Anytime you buy something on it, it automatically rounds up. If you get a, a Grab or an Uber or a coffee, it rounds up and puts the balance in your savings account. Okay, just to create the habits, right? How do you, get, how do you change consumers? The far right's one of our agents, okay? Financial advice is one of the ways you help people save. If you talk to our top advisors in almost any market, what a lot of their role is is to get people to do what they know they should do and to get through the complexity of the process for them, right? Put it in context. But again, these are all things that go back to, you know, how do we get someone to save for what's going to be a very long and hopefully very high quality life? We can also influence how long they're gonna live, okay? So this is an application that we just launched in Malaysia and we're gonna launch in 10 other markets. I think this crowd would see it as sort of a medical social environment. Uh, it is called Pulse. And a couple hundred thousand people have now downloaded it in Malaysia in its early launch. It is an artificial intelligence symptoms checker. It has a dengue fever predictive mapping technology. It has telemedicine referral, it has payment technology, it has doctor referral, right? And it's an environment that we can continue to expand the capabilities 
for our consumers. It's inclusive. We give it for free to people. Okay? We have a variety of ways that they can access the services. And it has, it's comprehensive. It, it takes your, your tracking data from, from a, a variety of sources. All of these things to try and make you be healthier and aim at longevity. And to move ourselves as a company out of the health event business into the longevity business, into, the, into the, the helping people live longer, healthier space. Okay, extremely popular. Quite Lots of support from governments on the launch. Provides them more accurate information on health. We can, you know, again, productivity, uh, new information, faster information to them on trends, but very, very interesting space. And again, we think it goes to helping people live longer. Um, and it's a very sophisticated platform. If you have a chance, go by our booth later and check it out. Tech is, some of the, the easy ways for tech to help people live longer are to address what are some of the largest issues one is mobility. So far left side here. It's basically an old suit. I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen these. You need to design, we need to be respectful of the fact people move differently at various points in life. Okay? Just the same way you would respect somebody having disabilities. Okay? This is a suit that helps designers design chairs you're sitting in, doorways, stairwells, and things and it simulates aging, okay? You put the goggles on, it reduces the, 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 the breadth of your vision. The ear, uh, the ear protection lowers your hearing. The body suit changes your, uh, replicates effectively arthritis. Not that everyone, I just showed you a 103 year old woman throwing the javelin. This does not imply that everyone who gets older gets health issues, but it's making somebody younger who's a creative or designer or engineer aware of what that other person's experience is. And very interesting technology. The middle piece is a technology that improves someone's gait. The most common accident that creates death in seniors is a fall. Okay? The falls disproportionately come from change in posture or change in gait. Okay? So some of the technology around that can have massive improvements in quality of people's lives. The last one's a robot, obviously. Um, one of the trends that's clear, and Singapore again is, is, is leading this, is there's an absolute direct correlation between social services, social interaction, and health services, longevity. Okay? If I retire and I move to an apartment that I stay alone in and I don't interact with other human beings, I'm going to have health issues. Okay? If I'm out in the world and I'm dealing with the world and I'm dealing with people, and I've got a, a, a community around me, whatever, however that's defined, where I'm challenged and I'm interactive, I'm gonna live longer, I'm gonna have less stress, I'm gonna have less health issues. This happens to be effectively a wellness robot, okay? There's a variety of techs coming around this space, but it's on the view that what you don't want is someone left out. That socially in a community, you don't want someone who has no interaction, no challenge. Combining these, you've got people living longer, aging faster. You've got medical technology on the plus side that can extend your life to a quite dramatic level. 100 is now biologically possible, 120 medically supported possible. Okay. You have two or three issues that I would suggest you want to watch. Breakthroughs on and, and chronic illness. Okay, probably the single most important thing the medical science can do for longevity now is a proper way to address diabetes. Okay, that can be at the cause, right? Change in behavior. That can be at the cure. That can be improvement in treatment, improvement of compliance in treatment. Any of those. Globally, that's that's probably the single most defining headwind. But lastly, the challenge of how we're going to pay for this population to retire and live probably 20 years longer than any actuary ever expected, right, is a real one. The United States Social Security system, the, the, uh, the funding for Social Security and, and retirement pensions in, in a variety of countries across Asia, if it exists, right, 
This is twice the burden that most people anticipated. So it requires a level of savings, product, engineering, uh, design. So, so that could be anything from robo-advice and things that help a consumer visualize what they need to do to convince them to change that behavior earlier. Right? Or it can be innovations in how they spend and lowering costs from medical to housing to transportation. But something in that space has to give because the current model doesn't get us to an outcome that the math works on. So on that happy note, thank you for joining me on the first session. I hope you have a wonderful conference and thank you to the MAS for having us here today. Goodbye.